All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Today we have, um, as our estate planning member of our all-star uh, panel of attorneys, we have here Jennifer Bunkers from Bo the Boyce Law Firm in Sioux Falls. And Jennifer uh, focuses in the areas of business law, real estate law, and then also uh, wills, trusts, estate planning probate and trust administration. Uh, Jennifer received her undergraduate degree from the University of Sioux Falls and then um, is a graduate of the USD Law School. She, um, in addition to being um, one of the top lawyers with the Boyce Law Firm, uh, Jennifer is busy as a member of the Sioux Falls Estate Planning Council and also um, serves as a member of the South Dakota Governor's Task Force on Trust Law Administration and Reform. Um, she is licensed to practice both in South Dakota and in Minnesota and we're very pleased to have her here today to uh, present to us on the area of estate planning. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me here. This is a very big room for a very small group. I feel pretty intimidated being up here. I feel like Professor Barron. I don't know if anybody had Professor Barron back in the day, but it's a very strange feeling to be up here, but thanks for your attention and your time to spend here today. Um, estate planning um, is, of course, the best area, area of practice. Um, of course, I'm biased, but at the same time, I always considered myself a lover more than a fighter, so that's as I ended up where I wanted to be. Um, kind of always knew in law school that this is the area I wanted to practice in. Um, I don't know if you guys have really found that yet or if you maybe decided you want to be a, a litigator and this is just a stepping stone to get your grade and get out of here. That's fine too. Um, but how I did this last year and what tended to work well is I have no trouble talking whatsoever and um, so I'll just talk for the whole time, but I don't want that to be the case. If you have questions, if you want to talk about specific things, um, cases you've talked about in class or just personal experience, please interject. I want this to be a two-way um, communication and, and worth your time to spend here and not just being lectured to. Um, so as uh, Marilyn mentioned, I got my degree here from USD um, and been practicing 10 years up in Sioux Falls. Um, grew up in a small town um, north of Sioux Falls, Del Rapids, if anybody knows where Del Rapids is. Thank you. Yes, the best town in Governor Dugard's from Del Rapids. Um, so that's our claim to fame. Um, but grew up in a small town and I had some exposure to the legal world um, just being a file clerk at that office back after high school but then was a non-trad, came back about six years after graduating from college um, and decided that um, law was where I wanted to be. But at any rate, um, as an estate planner, and even if you don't necessarily plan to be an estate planner, um, inevitably you're going to have somebody in your family or some relative or somebody here, oh, so-and-so is a lawyer, can you draft me up a will? Um, so it's going to happen, and so I think you at least need to have some kind of basic understanding of wills and trusts and probate and all the stuff that goes along with um, this area of the law, um, even if you don't plan to necessarily focus your attention here. Um, but resources in terms of where do you go to start, um, don't go to LegalZoom. Um, I don't know if any of you have had exposure to what they offer in terms of, they're actually pretty decent documents, but it's always the devil's in the detail and the practical experience about trying to apply someone's situation um, and their particular facts and family dynamics and all that stuff to um, the law. That is the tricky part and where estate planners really, I think, earn their salt when it comes to putting together a good estate plan. Um, and so when you're trying to, you know, if you're going to hang out your shingle or if you're going to go work in a firm or whatever you're going to do, um, resources you want on your bookshelf are certainly the code. Um, back in my day and still today, I have my actual paper copy hardcover book with my pocket parts and everything. I don't know if you guys even have those at the law school now anymore, but I'm old school and that's what I have. Um, at any rate, um, you got to have the code um, minimum. and. There's nothing that drives me more nuts than when interns show up at our office in the summertime and want a form. 
I understand we don't want to reinvent the wheel and you want to form, but there's nothing that can replace cracking open that book and looking at the code and actually learning, applying your degree to the work that you're doing. Um, when I first started, um, did some, my first probate, I took the, the code home and read it start to finish, barely stayed awake, but still, I mean, you got to have that background in that context before you're ever going to be able to be an effectual lawyer in this area of the law. Um, so nothing replaces the code. Um, also, the administrative rules for whatever state you practice in um, are really going to come more into play on the Medica Medicaid um, um, disability type planning areas of the law. So you will have some um, exposure to the um, the administrative rules, but primarily as an estate planner, what you're going to look toward um, is the state law. Um, many states, almost all states, I shouldn't say almost all because I don't know what the number is, but many, many states have adopted various forms of the uniform probate code when it comes to administration of estates, how many witnesses you got to have, the formalities of execution, um, all that type of stuff. And so there's a lot of uniformity. But not always. Um, even South Dakota, we did not. We don't follow the UPC exactly. Um, so you got to look at your particular state code to know how things are going to, um, um, what laws apply to your situation in practice. And also um, the Internal Revenue Code. Um, taxes are always next to making sure the people in your life get what you need. The one, the number two thing, and sometimes depending on the situation, the number one thing. Um, in an estate plan is taxes and trying to plan around certainly paying what you're o paying what is due and owing to the government but nothing more. Um, I wouldn't suggest you read uh, chapter 26 of the code <laughs> cover to cover you will fall asleep very convoluted area of the, of the law um, and back a generation ago I would say of attorneys um, and the attorneys I had in, interned for initially um, it used to be whether it was small town South Dakota or Sioux Falls, your estate planning attorney also did a fair share of tax work. So they prepared the 1040s, they prepared the 706s, they were actually filing the returns for all the estates they did, the income um, every year, you know, they're busy up until April 15th. And that was pro is priceless really because you learn so much by actually filling out a tax return on how to plan ahead of time once you see how things are going to actually fall out um, on the back end of an estate plan. Um, for better or for worse, um, you can maybe blame the, um, uh, the, the code for being so uh, just persnickety and things change so often that for better or for worse, now CPAs have really um, are an instrumental part of your team when you're trying to uh, advise a client, especially that has tax issues. Um, your CPA is going to know the tax issues inside and out, the real detailed things, but still as an estate planner you need to have a good understanding on a global level of how, you know, some of those basic exemptions and basic um, things to know um, to actually put documents together. So the code obviously is going to be a resource and if you're going to be an estate planner too, I'd make sure that you buddy up with a CPA or two and get them on, take them out to lunch or take them out for drinks or do something because you want that resource and to be able to call them and just say, hey, I got the situation, point me in the right direction. Um, also HIPAA, um, of course, this is old stuff now, um, but um, when it comes to a client that maybe is um, living but incapacitated, you know, how do we get access to records and that kind of thing? So you need to be aware of how to get a, not get around, but deal with HIPAA. Um, of course, the model rules of professional conduct, no matter what your practice area is, of course, that's got to be um, part of your, got to be familiar with how the um, professional rules apply. We're going to talk a little bit later about how joint representation of husband and wife is kind of a tricky, sticky wicket when it comes to estate planning. Um, we'll get into the more of that later. Um, and then also when it comes to resources, um, I'm also uh, licensed in Minnesota. Um, Minnesota has, and I think some of the larger states also have, they have a nice what they call a desktop reference um, binder, handbook, manual kind of thing that comes with um, annotated forms. Um, and so not to dig on forms, I already dug on forms before, but um, they have a nice starting spot where they have some standardization on what kind of estate planning documents are in those states. So that's kind of nice to have and sometimes you can use those to tweak them for whatever state you're in. Um, I'm not aware that South Dakota has anything like that at this time, but um, you might get some with your assignment today, but more of that later too. Um, any questions so far?
like I said, I'm going to keep on talking unless you raise your hand or back in my day it was you're playing solitaire on your at your laptop, Sarah. I don't know what you're doing now, but um, in terms of an overview of estate planning, you know, this is kind of the most common basic thing, but it comes up in every estate planning client um, appointment that I have. Um, when you're doing an estate plan, it's not just what happens when I die. Um, an estate plan is also what happens if I'm alive, but I can't. Are you doing that? Okay, all right. <laughs> Thought I hit a button. Um, what happens when I'm living, but I can't take care of stuff on my own? You know, whether that's because it was temporary, I was out of the country, or I was in a car accident, I'm recovering, or if I have dementia and I'm not going to get better. What happens then? Um, and so as powers of attorney need to be an integral part of any estate plan as well. Uh, not only who's going to mine my checkbook, keep paying my bills, especially if I'm a small business owner, someone's got to be running the, running the shop, you know, paying the electricity bill, keeping those things going while I'm either getting better or going downhill. Um, same thing with uh, not just money, but who's making my decisions about my health care. If I'm either medicated and I can't talk to the physicians and make my own decisions, who's going to be making it for me? And not only that, but who's not going to be making it for me? And those are the conversations that are not easy to have with your clients, but you got to dig in there and figure, figure it out. Otherwise, it's going to be a mess on the back end. Um, upon death, of course, we, I touched on this before, um, the unique and hard but gratifying thing about being in estate planning is um, a lot of times when my clients come in, I've never met them before. They've either come through me through a referral, um, uh, another client or maybe another attorney in my office, but I've not, I've not met them before. And here I sit down with them for an hour, two hours, and ask them, okay, tell me everything you own, tell me about your family, take all those skeletons out of the closet, put them on the table, and let's talk about them. That's not an easy thing to do. I mean, certainly they're coming to you, you're an attorney, they're going to trust you a little bit off the bat, but at the same point, you got to have the ability to really um, get the clients to talk and to really, because if I had a dime for every time I had a client come in and say, oh, my kids get along great. Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> We're not all the Brady Bunch. Um, but just to get the clients talking, and then they, you'll find the more you do it, there's little hints about maybe Johnny and Susie don't get along as well as mom and dad think they do. Um, but that's how you, you really refine your skills in a estate planner to figure those issues out quickly um, and then know how to address them. Um, taxes, again, I'm going to hit on this. You got to, um, some clients don't care quite frankly about taxes. It's amazing. Um, I'm just amazed. I have some clients that will do anything to avoid taxes. They're also called farmers. Um, and then there's some that just don't care. They figured I'd had a good living. I owe the government what I owe them. Let them take it. You know, they don't want to do any fancy planning to try to avoid it. Um, tax avoidance, not tax evasion. Remember that. Um, but also, what are the client's objectives? Again, you're going to have a short amount of time um, normally to sit down with that client and really nail down why they're there, what they want to accomplish. Um, and while we're on farmers, did anybody grow up on a farm or had any farmers in their background or family farm somewhere? My husband farms. I live it every day. Um, 99.9% .9 of farmers will say, I want the land to stay in the family. They all want that. And depending on my relationship with the client, I am, to, I am inclined to tell them, I want big boobs and a small waist, but we can't have everything we want. Um, because you can certainly, you know, as an attorney, you can do a lot of fancy things, and I can write this perfect agreement, but it's a matter of practical life applying to a, an agreement that is stale, and quite frankly, one generation off the farm, they're going to have some attachment to it. Two generations off the farm, show me my money and let me go on my way. I mean, that's just the reality of it. So, again, as a, if you're going to practice in South Dakota, you're going to have a farmer walk into your office, so just be prepared for that. And you got to have the gut sometime to tell them their, their ideals won't work. You know, we I have plenty of lovely Norman Rockwell idealist ladies that, more ladies than men come and just think that they just they don't want my I don't want my kids to fight. I want the farm to stay in the family. And again, you know, a lot of that that ship has sailed if you screwed up on raising your kids. But <laughs> um, 
But at the same time, I mean, you got to have those conversations and just kind of, again, have them volunteer some information of how do your kids really get along? What's Christmas like? Does everybody come back and celebrate together? I mean, you get an idea of how well they get along by asking some other questions. So family dynamics, uh, you cannot underestimate that. Any questions so far? Yeah. Yeah. So when your clients come in, do you have some sort of intake form that you try to have them fill out in order to ferret some of this initial information out before? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, for two reasons. Number one, to make it an efficient appointment, like you said, ferret out that information so you have all the pieces of the puzzle from the get-go. You know how many kids they have, how old they are, what they have for assets, absolutely. And then two, if something else, you know, we're lawyers, CYA, so if something happens on the back end and they've got some, you know, IRA that they forgot to tell you about, no beneficiaries are named, they, you can't really be on the hook for that because they never told you about it. So. It has two valuable components. Yeah. So is it easier for you to do this kind of work for people you don't know? That's an interesting question. Um, quite frankly, yes. Um, I get the, for, uh, inevitably, there's like people at church or people my kids go to school with or whatever that say, hey, can you help me with my estate plan? And I like that from the sense that they trust me to do that. But it also gets really weird when I'm at the basketball game and I know, you know, because they've shared all this information with me about how this daughter, you know, can't keep a husband and, you know, they, she's got credit problems. And it just makes the social part of my life a little awkward. So I try to keep those separate as much as possible. So what do you recommend that the associate where you want to bring in business with people you know? It also makes it kind of hard to work with well, my approach is uh, the, the ocean is big, um, that I can make a living without getting too close to home. That's just my, I mean, if they come to me, I'm not going to necessarily tell them no, unless I know I have a particular conflict of interest or something like that. But I certainly don't market myself to my friends and my home. And I'm a little bit unique because I live 40 miles away from where I practice. And so I have a little bit easier time keeping those separate. Um, it just gets sticky. It gets, I don't, I find it awkward and some people don't and I, you know, that's not saying it's, you should or you shouldn't. It's just a matter of your, per, your preference. I just want to detach from work a little bit. So when I go to my kid's basketball game, I don't have to be worried about some, someone, you know, bending my ear at halftime and asking me about, oh, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, good question though. All right. Okay. How do I go back? Uh, drive for me. Yeah. Thank you. Um, more so too, there's a, I remember one of my first jobs as an associate was to research a case, and of course I'm not going to remember the name of it now, but it had to do, it was a um, legal malpractice case where, I'm going to try to get this right, husband and, it was a second marriage, and any second marriage estate plan Make sure your uh, malpractice insurance is up to date before you do it. Um, it just gets sticky. Um, it was a situation where husband was a farmer, second wife, um, and the will said all my farmland goes to my kids. Great, wonderful. Problem, farmland was titled joint tenancy with rights of survivorship between husband and wife. So where did the land go? to the wife who didn't get the land the sons who sued the attorney the sons um, and in that case um, our Supreme Court one of the holdings was that as the attorney you have a duty to to figure out how things are held to figure out what the title is you can't rely on your client that kind of seems weird doesn't it you know you can't rely on the, what your client tells you but at the same time you know these are particular you know, intricate details that a lot of times, most of the time, clients don't appreciate. Um, so as part of that, too, you had asked about an intake form, and that's exactly what's one of the questions on the intake form. How is it held? <coughs> um, so you're asking the client. But my approach, I'm belts and suspenders type of approach, I'm going to actually, especially with real estate, because it's so easy to check <laughs> the title for real estate because it's available at the Register of Deeds. Um, I don't rely on my client when they say, oh, my house is jointly held, don't worry about it. Um, I'll pull the deed. 
ten bucks, well, one dollar to actually requ request it, thirty bucks to file a new one. So um, it's worth it um, to figure that out on the front end. Um, and what's interesting now um, with estate planning, it's not just a matter of doing a will, whipping up some powers of attorney, and giving them to your client. Um, so many assets, and this is changing every year, um, especially since I just think when I first got out of law school, how much it's changed. Um, but so many assets have beneficiary designations on them. Um, and what kind of effect does your will have when you... I've beneficiary designated my ex-husband on my life insurance policy, but my will says everything goes to my new husband. Well, guess what? Bonanza for my ex-husband because those beneficiary designations are valid no matter what your will says. We do have a statute in the Uniform Probate Code that says um, spouses are automatic, ex-spouses are automatically out when it comes to testamentary documents, um, powers of attorney, um, wills, that kind of thing, but it's not so for beneficiary designated accounts. Um, and so many things are beneficiary designated now. Um, life insurance typically always has been, um, but when IRAs and 401ks now are the, the uh, more common way to set up retirement benefits than back in the annuity days, uh, or defined uh, benefit plans. So you really got to coordinate not only the will, but what those beneficiary designations have um, as well. Um, another reason you need that intake form to kind of figure out what's governed by the will, what's governed by, by beneficiary designation forms. Um, I have a paralegal at my office that spends probably 30% of her time filling out beneficiary designation forms. Um, because again, not that I don't trust my client, but when they walk out of my office, I don't want to just send them with some instructions because every form for every company is different. I want them to have, I want their estate plan to be right, quite frankly. And so that's part of the puzzle is putting that together for your client. Um, again, tax issues, you've got to be very sensitive to tax issues when it comes to IRAs, 401ks, Roth IRAs, anything that has a tax deferred feature where income tax has been um, deferred for all that time. Um, there, there are some instances, most instances, instances where you can roll that over at least one time. Um, and so you don't want to blow that necessarily by either not having a beneficiary designation or naming a non-qualified trust as a beneficiary. Um, so there's a lot of like moving parts to an estate plan. Um, distribution and specific requests. Um, what's really common, and it's kind of like divorce when you think about it. When you're doing an estate plan, um, the kids are going to fight about things like um, china, furniture, heirloom things, jewelry, those types of things. Ironically, a lot of times they're not going to care about, you know, the, the $2 million brokerage account at Edward Jones. They're going to fight about, well, so-and-so got um, mom's wedding room. Um, and it, like the divorce, I don't know, the joke is that they'll fight about a lamp, but they don't care about, you know, some other more valuable assets. Um, but in the same vein, um, it's a part of the Uniform Probate Code. You can have a separate personal property designation list so that personal property can go toward um, whoever you want it to, as long as we can identify it and the writings in your um, client's handwriting or signed by them and reference in the will. This is all part of Chapter 29A. Um, that's a nice feature, and I really stress to my clients that they take advantage of that um, because that's what kids are going to fight over or your heirs are going to fight over. It's going to be those sentimental heirloom type things. Um, and so knowing that, you know, mom, dad, whomever wanted it to go toward to someone specific. Number one, it's kind of heartfelt and warm fuzzy for the person receiving it. Number two, it adds some clarity to what mom and dad wanted because, of course, when they're gone, it's easy to have your own interpretation of what they wanted. Yeah. On the tax deferred accounts, mm -hmm. do you, if they choose to keep them outside of the state plan and tax yep. reasons, do you somehow document that? that discussion that shows that or do you refer to their CPA? I have cryptic or, notes. <laughs> yeah, well, in my cover letter too, once I send draft documents <laughs> out to the client, I try to cover all those things in there. Okay. Yep. Like what are the next steps? We get the documents in place. Next steps usually are beneficiary designation forms, transferring title if we need to, those types of things. You bet. 
Um, anybody familiar with the probate process at all? You're shaking your head. I'm going to put you on the spot. What do you know about probate? Oh, I work for a attorney right now. We have um, an insolvent probate. Oh. Um, we have to go through probate. That is not fun. <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah, well, probate is a legal proceeding where we uh, your will is authenticated, submitted to the court. The court appoints an administrator or a called personal representative now, but back in the day it was executor and executrix. But now we're gender neutral and all politically correct. Um, but that's the person in charge of your estate. So they're in charge of marshaling assets, figuring out what you own, paying your bills, and distributing whatever's left, or in your case, not left, you know, distributing that amongst either the creditors or the heirs. Um, and it's really gotten a bad name, and I kind of blame attorneys for part of this, but um, but back in the day, um, attorneys would normally take, and this is statutory, around 2.5% more or less um, of the estate is what they were allowed to take in their fee. Um, well, you can imagine that got to be a pretty hefty fee. And so um, probate got this um, name, but it's really expensive to go through probate. Well, it probably was back in 1965, but it's 2016. Um, and not that probate's cheap, because anytime you hire an attorney, you know, we cost money, and rightly so, and so it's not free. Um, but at the same time, um, it is what it is. I mean, it's not nearly how it expenses it as it used to be, but it's, um, it still costs money. Um, but most states that have the UPC have what's called informal probate, where I like to describe it where the court or the clerk, actually, in that instance, um, gets the will, appoints the um, personal representative, and basically, unless you have issues, you don't ever come back to court until it's time to close. And even then, you don't have to close it if you don't want to. So instead of holding or having to come to court and get permission to do different things, you know, there, the, the focus is and the intent is allow independent administration of the estate. And basically, onus is on the PR to make sure they're doing it right. Um, and so it's less expensive because you don't have to, there's less court filings, there's less attorney time involved really because the PR has the authority to kind of take care of things um, without a lot of um, legal involvement. Um, and most of the times that works just fine. Um, so it's not nearly as expensive as it used to be. But um, again, you know, society changes over time and privacy is a lot bigger thing than it used to be. Um, and so for some reasons, or for some legitimate reasons, clients don't like probate because it's a public thing and, the, and privacy is, I don't want to say breached, but, you know, your will is, become, is part of the public record. Um, you know, we live in South Dakota, so it's not online like in a lot of states, but it, but it is public, you know, and anybody, I could walk into the courthouse down here in Vermilion and get a copy of whatever last probate was filed and get a copy of somebody's will. Um, and if the file is complete, it would show what, you know, the entirety of the inventory, what the person owned, who got what. Um, and again, with the sensitivity to privacy now, um, that's stuff that some clients just don't want in the public eye. Um, and so a very popular, popular alternative to a traditional will and probate is a thing called living trust. Um, the living trust arrangement or revocable trust, living trust, revocable trust, same thing. Um, and under that scenario or that, you know, um, that type of estate plan, you actually fund the trust during the life of the grantor, um, the testator, the person making the estate plan, um, and then grease the wheels and put a nice little wrapper around their estate and kind of get organized from the get-go. And then when some, either the grantor passes away or they have a dis disabling event of some nature, they've named a successor trustee to take over. Um, and essentially do what a personal representative does, but outside um, the view of the court, which could be, of course, good or bad. Um, good in the sense that it's, pu it's private, it's not public. Um, bad, perhaps, if you listen to some commentators, because then you don't have the benefits of going to court. Like when you publish notice to creditors and get to shorten the statute of limitations and get some more legal finality to an estate versus, um, you know, so you got a way of privacy, and finality depending on what kind of a state you have. Um, but again, for those reasons, living trusts have become the will substitute. Um, and again, being a farm girl, I explain it, it's like a John Deere or Case IH. I mean, one's not better than the other. Well, one's better than the other, but I won't tell you which. Um, but it's just a matter of your preference. Any questions there? 
Um, Long-term planning is the last bullet here on this slide. Um, Again, you know, I get a lot of clients coming in. I shouldn't say a lot, but there's always clients that want to come in and say, how do I make sure that the nursing home doesn't get my house? Um, and I kindly say nursing home insurance um, because, I mean, quite frankly, there's a 60-month look back, a five-year look back, um, so that it's not as easy as, oh, gee, you know, it's time for me to go in the nursing home because I can't live on my own anymore. I'm going to give all my assets to my kids. And lo and behold, jeepers, you know, I don't have any money and I qualify for state assistance. It doesn't work that way. They, they look back 60 months from the date you apply for nursing home care and see what you've either gifted away or transferred away. And they essentially, if you gifted all your stuff away in that time period, they treat you like you own it. And so you're disqualified until you've exhausted those resources. Um, so for that reason, it's, I don't want to say impossible, there are some, you know, some strategies that could work if you want to really um, predict. I mean, that's the hard thing. None of us know we're going to go in a nursing home. We don't know when. We don't know for how long. I mean, you're really looking at the crystal ball. Um, and so the, and you got to, before you're even going to qualify for state assistance, you're going to have to drain down and use your resources and spend those down to, I think the threshold's still $2,000. I mean, think about that. You probably ought to qualify now because of student loan debt, but um, when you're, Older, hopefully that's not the case. Uh, Medicaid is state specific as well, so although a lot of federal dollars get dumped into that bucket, the regulations are state specific. Any questions, comments? Um, I touched on this before, um, and it's a sticky wicket. Um, I apologize, I used that phrase before, but. Um, as a lot of things, uh, as a lawyer, you'll find, you know, it's not always easy, um, especially when you have the husband-wife come to see you. Um, and a lot of times, you know, you'll get a good sense of how much mom and dad, husband-wife share with one another um, and how in tune they are with one another um, shortly into the, the client meeting. Um, the one story I'll share with you, and, it floored me, but I was in a uh, meeting with a husband and wife, and the husband out of the blue said, "Now let's talk about divorce. What happens if one of us divorces? Or that? what happens if we divorce? And the wife looked at him, and if, she, if looks could kill, I mean, and so, and I was blindsided as well. He had not talked to me before about, well, gosh, I might divorce my wife. Um, but he decided to bring that up in front of me. But when you have a joint representation, there's nothing that he tells me that I can't, I'm obligated to share that with her. I can't keep secrets between spouses. And you need to understand that as an attorney and they need to understand that as clients. So they're not relying on you to give them independent advice between, um, you know, between each other. Um, I, I spell that out usually in my engagement letter or if it's not in the engagement letter, we have standard terms of representation for a firm that we send out along with the engagement letter to make that clear. Um, not just in estate planning, but any time you're representing husbands and wives, you know, and a lot of times they're on the same team, you know, and they're aligned in what they want. Um, not always, especially in those second marriage situations. Um, so you just want to make sure that's clear from the front end. Um, and the fee discussion. It's never easy to, um, I've been practicing a while now, and it's just never easy for me to say I charge X for this or it's going to cost you X and talk about money. I don't know if it was just I was raised Dutch or I, I don't know what it is, but I find it odd to talk about money. Um, but at the same time, I found, you know, experience, it's better for the client to know up front what this is going to cost me for at least a ballpark and estimate your best guess than to deal with it on the back end. Um, get those expectations out on the table from the start. Um, and testamentary and capacity issues, undue influence. Um, it's never fun to have those discussions with your clients. And, you know, I've had the, the, the pleasure, really. I mean, I've, again, as, a, as an estate planner, it's a little bit different relationship. You really get close to some of your clients, um, especially over the years as, you know, you get to know their family and um, you develop a relationship with them. It's, and it's a really rewarding area to practice in as well. You know, and you do see it when clients start to, de start to decline. Um, it was a hard set. I had this little lady, just a peach of a gal, but, you know, I could tell things just weren't quite going up to the top floor like they had been. Um, 
and for better or for worse, you know, I had to have the conversation with her that I needed her to go to a doctor and to have the doctor examine her to make sure that she could handle her financial affairs. I mean, so that's not an easy conversation to have, but better to have it on the front end and have the doctor evaluate her. Um, they do what they call mini mental exams, and I'm not medical whatsoever, so some of you who may have medical backgrounds can fill in my blanks here. Um, but the doctors usually use the minty, mini mental exam, as I think it's called, um, to examine someone to determine whether or not um, there's a start of dementia, what their cognitive abilities are, so that um, we can somehow determine then, do they have the sufficient mental capacity to execute their estate plan? Um, the standard for that can be found in the Uniform Pro um, Probate Code. Um, generally speaking, you need to know the objects of your bounty, I think is what it's called. Um, and basically, know what you have, know who you want to give it to. Um, and of course, that is the subject of many litigation cases um, in our state and many states. Um, it's never an easy thing. I mean, it's never a bright line. It's not like when you're cooking the turkey on Thanksgiving and the thing pops out when it's done. It is a very gray area. Um, if there's any question at all, I have my client go see a um, go see a physician. And even then, it's not clear. I mean, doctors don't have a crystal ball either to see if somebody's got their marbles or not. Um, so it, it's, it's a tricky issue, but you know, you always got to be in mind or thinking when you're giving advice, how's this going to look in a deposition later? How, if I have to give an affidavit, how's this going to look? You know, if I have client notes or maybe not, that's not a good example. Um, but every piece of paper, you know, is that going to be exhibit A to something later when the kids come back and fight or somebody comes back and fights about it? Um, you hate to think about that, but that's the name of the game. What do you say to the client when they come back and they do not have capacity? The doctor says it isn't okay for them to make those decisions. Um, Basically, I mean, you kind of, I just say, well, it turns out we're not going to be able to, you know, amend your trust or we're not going to get, we're not going to be able to do X, whatever they initially came in to do. We're not going to be able to do that. Um, you know, and sometimes that goes well, sometimes it doesn't. You know, it just depends on the client. Um, you know, I, I, you never want to manipulate anybody, but at the same time, you know, it's like if somehow they, they think it's their idea, they're going to swallow it a lot better. You know, just say, oh, you don't, you know, kind of like, well, you've appointed, you know, your son, James, to do this for you. You know, then you don't have to worry about it anymore. Let the power of attorney take over. You don't have to manage your financial affairs anymore. Less for you to worry about. Less for you to think about. You know, I mean, I do have the blunt conversation, but I don't nail it in there. You know, I soften it up. <laughs> oh. What records do you keep then and they come back? Mm-hmm. You're not able to amend something or even to make something. I mean, but when stuff eventually hits the fan, if it does, mm -hmm. how do you track that to kind of CYA? Um, well, letters to the client are always good. I mean, the your, your obligation, your duty is to the client to keep them reasonably informed. Um, and that even goes when they don't have capacity. Um, and then to um, their agent under power of attorney then is essentially representing your client. Um, more often what actually happens is that you'll find doctors, it's, it, you don't have to have perfect um, capacity or perfect, what's the term in this, um, the, the case law. I mean, you don't have to have perfect comprehension and be at the top of your game to effect, effectuate a estate plan. Um, so a lot of times what I'm finding myself doing is doing a memo to the file after I've had a client execute an estate plan, going through the, I met, you know, Doris on this day and we did X, Y, and Z, and then I recommended she go to Dr. Smith. She saw Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith came back and said this, and then I went, because I've been to every nursing home in Sioux Falls, um, which is not good. I mean, it doesn't look good for litigation. Like, if anything's executed in a, in a nursing home, it doesn't look good. It's not a good fact to have. Um, so <laughs> there's another tip. Make sure your clients, if they can, get to the office to sign their stuff. Um, but if I, you know, I was at a, well, sometimes they're just in rehab, you know, temporarily in a nursing home. So I've gone to plenty, plenty of those. But then the, the note or the memo to the file is, you know, I took, 
these two witnesses and this notary with me, we all went, we all talked about X, Y, and Z, and then just run through the facts of the situation because they will be invaluable if there's litigation later. Um, and if there ever is, you know, because you think about it, if there is any challenge to an estate plan that you put together, you're a witness now. You can't represent anybody in that fight anymore. You're a witness. Um, so the minute you think, you know, if I did a will for John, John Smith, um, and his clients are fighting over it, I have to recuse myself. I can't administer the estate anymore because I'm going to be a witness. Um, and for your client's sake, it's better to do that. If you have any whiff of that's going to happen, get out from the start. Um, it'll just save your client some money and some allegations that you were kind of in on it, so to speak, because all kinds of sibling rivalry and other things come up when you're administering an estate and there's a will contest. Um, Selection of fiduciaries is a bullet point on here too. Um, this is again where you got to get your client to talk and figure out who in their life um, is going to be a good fiduciary. When you think of a fiduciary in an estate plan, that's your personal representative, your trustee, your agent under a power of attorney. Those folks that are going to have responsibility to manage stuff when, you're, when your client can't. Um, for better or for worse, for whatever reason, that usually falls on the oldest child if it's a ch children's situation. Um, I've read lots of books on um, uh, um, birth order, and what I found the funniest is that most of the books I was reading initially were to make sure my kids, I don't screw up my own kids and send them to counseling later, but I found it actually more applicable to my clients um, because the same issues you deal with with kids that are minor 11 and 8 right now are the same issues you deal with when, you're, when your client's kids are 60 and 55. I mean, those things don't go away. It's because somebody got a Superman lunchbox back in the day and I didn't. Um, and so a lot of those skills that you try to um, hone in as a parent, you're going to find useful um, um, dealing with uh, families if you do any litigation and, or involved in families that are fighting. Um, but again, you got to make sure that, you know, because I've had the, the difficult conversation too with a client where um, uh, the client had three kids, um, two were not living in the area, one was living in the area, but gosh, he had two felony convictions for money laundering. She wanted to name him as her power of attorney for financial matters. I wouldn't do it, you know, and that's not an easy conversation to have either with your client, but, you know, and again, you try to say, no, it's not a good idea. I'm sure he's great now. He's set straight. He's, you know, clean as he can be, but at the same time, well, you know that your other kids are really going to throw darts at that guy, so let's not put him in that situation um, because that's just right for, you know, your client to take advantage of their parent. Um, that's another common theme you'll see in estate planning is when your client, it, it's, it's, it's a very, um, gets to be a gray area when your client you suspect is maybe getting taken advantage of by their own children. And mothers especially are the last ones to acknowledge that's happening. But at some point, um, I have one going on right now where we're contemplating a restraining order against um, uh, my client's own child. And you hate to think it comes to that. But when mom can't say no, you know, you got to take it out of her hands. Um, second marriages. I've made fun of this, and I apologize if any of you are in that situation. But um, for whatever reason, we're all born with this um, um, ingrained, um, probably unconscious idea that everything has to be equal. But legally, we all know that doesn't have to be the case. But any time, and you guys probably never had Professor Gingas, but he was my uh, wills and trust professor. Um, and I didn't get it when I was sitting in your shoes, but I totally get it now. He said, any time, he said, try to talk your, your client out of, if they want to get, if they have three kids and they want to give it to their three kids unequally, do whatever you can to talk them out of it. I'm like, well, that's ridiculous. If that's what they want to do, that's what they should do. Um, you know, and, and for better or for worse, that doesn't work out, you know, and unless somebody's had a lot of counseling before mom and dad died and has really come to the terms with they're not mom and dad's favorite, um, they're not going to think it's fair, you're going to end up in litigation anytime, you can ask any attorney who practices in trust and, and uh, state litigation, the only people that win in those cases are the attorneys because we get paid and 
the clients never get what they want. Um, there's only so much of the pie to be given out, and they're never going to think whatever it is is fair. Um, so in those situations where, um, where parents or whomever they want to give it to children unequally, um, you just have to counsel them that they need. And I have clients that have done that, but I've counseled them, again, in my, my letter to them saying, you understand, we talked about this is going to end in a fight. You're willing to take the chance. You know, um, there you go, because I don't want to get sued for malpractice. On the other end, I just don't want the family to go through it, because those are wounds that are not easily healed, and most of the time are not. Um, because sometimes the, the kids that are not getting the full share that they thought they were getting think they should or they had no idea that they were not going to get the full share. And that is a very hard pill to swallow, especially when your parent is then gone and you can't ever um, have that conversation with or understand why. That's not the kind of legacy you want to leave um, if you can help it. Um, I don't know how I got on that, but second marriages, I kind of got on that um, equal distribution key there too. With second marriages, it's even amplified um, because what do you give the second wife um, to make it fair to your kids? For the kids, you know, if, I, if I'm remarried, I want to make sure that my kids get what is mine. Um, but I don't want to disinherit my spouse. Um, and as an estate planner, you need to be familiar with the um, elective share statutes. Again, can be found in 29A2. That is where, because you can't disinherit your spouse without their consent, is the easy way to put that. Um, the longer you're married, the more you're entitled to as a spouse. Um, and clients need to understand that. And so anytime I have a client that has lost a spouse, when I'm administering the estate and I have a widow or a widower, my first advice, I mean, they don't want it. Well, I shouldn't say first advice, but once kind of we've taken care of the dust has settled a little bit from the estate and they're not ready to date yet, but I always tell them, if you ever think of getting married, you come see me and we're going to do a prenup. You have to do that, any second marriage, to avoid the whole fights over, um, you know, taking care of your spouse versus taking care of your own kids. Because um, you'll see that, too, if you look at um, our cases here in South Dakota. The estate cases, the will contests, are more often than not second marriage situations. Because that's a, it's, a t it's tough to, to carve the apple to satisfy everybody. Um, and again, depending on how long that surviving spouse la or lives and all these unknown factors. Yeah? I'm sorry, what's that? Oh, yeah, yep, we do those too. Um, with postnuptials, you just, the extra kind of burden is the consideration issue. Because with a prenup, usually the marriage is the consideration. They can always say no to the marriage. But especially if I have the rich spouse, and let's say we want to tweak the prenup, um, because of whatever reason. We encourage our clients to then, the rich spouse, give her the lake home or give her this savings account or give her this life insurance policy. That's very, gen I'm sorry about that. The rich spouse could be a woman, come on now. Um, but have, have a consideration so it can't be, because that could be turned over if there's lack of consideration, especially if the poor spouse is giving up a substantial sum. You want to cross that threshold and give up some of your the rich spouse. And a lot of times they don't have problems with that. It's worth it. I mean, and that's your job as the attorney, just to tell them it's worth it. You're going to save attorney's fees, you know, if you just give her that life insurance policy. Um, so special needs. Um, there are, if, quite frankly, I don't do a lot of special needs trusts. I'm, blessed that another attorney in my office knows a lot about that stuff and loves that stuff, so he practices in that area more than I do. Um, but you'll see these, either third-party trusts um, set up by, you'll see it most often, I think, I shouldn't talk because I don't do a lot of this, but um, think of a car accident where you have a minor who was injured and they get a settlement from the insurance proceeds um, from the insurance company. They got all these proceeds and you want to make sure it's not gone or taken or mom and dad spend it on a Lamborghini because that's what the kid really needs. Um, and so you'll set up a special needs trust for that child because they might have lifelong health care needs or you know medical considerations or you want to make sure it's spent for college. You'll see that sometimes as part of an um, insurance settlement. Um, we do a lot of insurance defense work in our firm and so we'll see some of that type of thing come out of those insurance settlements. Um, but also you can set up your own special needs trust and the name of that game is to make sure that you um, are really um, 
in that sweet spot of making sure that your beneficiary qualifies for government type programs, Medicaid, um, Social Security, um, SSDI um, versus um, not, so you want them to qualify for those programs, but yet allow the trust to pay for those things that the government programs won't pay for, um, like a nicer wheelchair or um, trips, vacations, um, um, uh, an equipped van, those types of things. Um, so there's there's a lot of information now with the internet. You got it's almost overload, and you never know what you can trust. But um, there's a lot of different. Um, Pretty unique things you can do with special needs trusts that are, yeah. Um, an area where I see that people don't realize is like they've gone to all this work to set up these benefits for their now adult children. Mm -hmm. It takes a ton of work. Mm -hmm. They don't have the special needs trust, but then yet they've equally left their assets or their life insurance or whatever to that child. Right, and it blows and the qualification. Keep them out of all that they've worked for to set them up for. Right. So it's important to have to understand how right. important those. Well, and again, you know, to get to that, to even know that that's an issue, on my intake form, that's a question. You know, how is the health of your beneficiaries or your heirs? Um, so that you can maybe flesh out some of those issues. And then if the child doesn't already have a special needs trust, to maybe set up a testamentary special needs trust for that child. Um, to really, so they don't blow their exemption, or not exemption, but qualification. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, it is five to five. You want to keep going, or you want to take a break? All right. We're going to keep trucking along. All right. Um, questionnaires and forms. Um, part of your assignment is a completed questionnaire form um, from the couple. And if you ever watched Mad Men, you'll recognize the names in that. Um, but we touched on this before. The questionnaire, the intake form, whatever you want to call it, is um, really invaluable. Not only does it speed up the process when that client comes in, you know, because you bill by the hour, so you want things as efficient as possible, and you want to respect their time as well. I mean, because a lot of times they're taking off time from work to come in and visit with you. Um, the more that more information you can get ahead of time, um, the better off your your whole appointment is going to go. Um, and you'll learn through practice too what kind of questions to ask. I, I mentioned the health issue as well. Um, and it's funny how on paper they'll be a lot more honest than, than they will normally when you're talking to them. Somehow we don't want to articulate if we're facing a illness or disease or something, but to put it on paper makes it a little bit easier, um, but to flesh out those issues. And even so, there's different types. I have I have my short form and my long form. Um, and again, kind of depending on the client and how well I know them or don't know them. Um, and part of what the, the longer form includes is actual questions, like how important is, you, is it to you to make sure your kids are treated equally? How important is it to you that you're going to protect um, your estate from creditors? Um, and to really kind of try to, again, identify those issues that are really important to your clients so you can um, pinpoint those from the start. And of course, educate them on the entirety of an estate plan and all the different things that can come up because clients sometimes don't think of the things that, um, you know, the pitfalls um, that you, uh, you know, after you have the experience um, can really, you can see that train wreck coming a lot of times just by looking at the form. Um, but also, too, just to um, nursing home. I mean, that's usually top of everybody's list. Um, but getting that out ahead of time. Um, and so that's a lot of times. I don't typically see anybody the first, like, they call for an appointment. I don't see them at least for two weeks because I want the form to get out there, and I want them to take the time to fill it out. Um, we're all busy. Nobody wants to do that. Think of when you go into the doctor's office and how many times do I have to write my name and my address and all this stuff on the piece of paper. You don't like doing it. But the more time you give them to actually do it, the better off you're going to be um, and able to help them, quite frankly. Um, we don't have, well, I shouldn't say we don't have. I got this question wrong in the bar exam. I'll never forget it. But um, there was an essay question about estate planning, and, and it had to do with the joint will of a husband and wife. And I incorrectly said you can't do that in South Dakota. You can. 
practically you don't, but you can. Um, um, but usually we do a will for each spouse. I mean, if you remember the Tylenol case, or I don't remember the name of it, where um, you know nobody really dies at the same time. Um, so you want to have separate wills for husband and wife um, if you have a married couple. Um, and of course, minor children. Um, with the minor children, you want to name guardians, of course, to have custody of the kids if something happens to mom and dad, but also a trustee to handle the finances. Those people can be the same. They don't have to be. You know, and you have to talk to the client. What's best for them? Do, you, do, do, do they need a check and balance? Do they have people in their lives that have the skill set to raise children, but also have the skill set to manage money for the children? A lot of times, people don't have both skill sets. Yet, we all have children, so it's crazy. Um, but also, the durable power of attorney, I touched on this before, um, especially for that business owner. Um, somebody's got to make payroll if I'm hit by a truck. You know, so. Um, a lot of times that's either accounted for directly in that they might have somebody in the business that can sign on business accounts, um, which is more practical than having your spouse do it because the spouse more often than not has no idea what happens in the business. You want somebody, um, or maybe it's a dual role because you don't want, perhaps, perhaps you don't have somebody at work or in your business that you trust implicitly with the finances. You want the wife to at least be involved, but um, gosh, again, the wife. And the wife can be the business owner. Um, but at any rate, um, make sure you have the contingency plan if, you, if something bad happens. Um, and I am a big believer, too, in not only having one person named, no matter what the role is, trustee, personal representative, power of attorney. You have your A team, you have your B team. Because something could happen to your A guy, and especially, and it's funny, you know, especially the couple that comes in, they just had their first child, maybe their second child, they want to set up a will. They never needed one before, never thought they did. Then they come in and they want to name their parents as guardians of their kids. Great, wonderful. Your parents are 20, 30 years older than you are. Let's make sure we have a B team in case mom and dad pass away. Um, because, too, you want to give them a, a flexible document that not only works today, but will work 10 years from now because they're not going to get back. It's hard enough for those folks to get in, into you to see you the first time. Again. You don't have to do it, and so a lot of people don't do it. I don't know what the statistic is, but used to, uh, I saw one time that it was 80% of Americans don't have a will. Um, so you get the state gets to decide, well, who gets your stuff? Um, because, again, we're busy doing stuff we have to do, and you don't have to do an estate plan. So make sure that you, again, my, my philosophy, make sure the document works today and try to anticipate in your crystal ball what's going to happen and make it a flexible document that they can have some utility for, for years to come. Any questions? Moving on. Um, this is a little bit more about the actual the medical health care living will power of attorney. Um, don't have it too often, but organ donation. Um, those types of things, when it comes to organ donation, um, specific burial requests, um, I encourage people to go directly to those organizations, whether it's the funeral home for a funeral plan, or um, I know many communities have one. The one in our, um, our area for organ donation is the South Dakota Alliance. They just changed their name, shoot. Um, but actually go to those organizations and alert them that you want to be a donor. Because a lot of times when you're in that situation, if you're in the car wreck, you know, Make sure that donation thing is listed on your driver's license because by the time we're going to look at a power of attorney or a will, you're going to be in the ground and the t that ship has sailed. Um, and so make sure that you're actually working with the people that um, are going to be involved in those short times after death um, because it's not like the movies. It's not like, you know, the first call you make from the hospital after somebody died is the attorney. I can't do anything for 120 hours after somebody died. I mean, that's state law. Um, there's no reading of the will. I mean, Hollywood totally made that up. Um, so I am not going to be first on the call list. So if you want organ donation, specific burial requests, work directly with the folks that are going to take care of that for you um, is my practical advice. Not that you can't do it in our documents, but practically you want to do that directly with um, those agencies. Um, the transmittal letter that goes with the estate planning documents, um, I like to give them a Cliff Notes version. When I send out documents, I want to give them the Cliff Notes version because inevitably um, there's a lot of legalese that goes into wills and powers of attorney, and they're going to look at that. Their eyes are going to glaze over, and they're going to be like, what? Um, but 
give them the Cliff Notes version, but also say it's imperative that you read it, of course. You know, you don't want them to be doing something they don't understand. Um, miscellaneous items, I kind of touched on this before too, especially independent verification um, of, the, of titling of assets. Um, one of the first forms I have my client sign is an authorization so that either myself or my paralegal, we can actually call the bank and see how title's held to your bank account. So we can call Edward Jones or Waddell and Reed or whomever, who are your beneficiaries on that account? So they'll actually talk to us and we can get the information we need um, to verify um, what our clients tell us. Um, ethical considerations, um, again, we can't keep secrets between spouses or joint clients. Um, it's good and bad. Um, something to note up front, um, attorney-client privilege. Um, this I could give a whole talk on, um, not blowing the, blowing the attorney-client privilege. Um, financial advisors are notorious for wanting to meet with you and your clients. And I understand why, and they have good intentions on doing that, um, because they want to make sure that they're kind of the quarterback of the, the estate plan. Um, you know, your financial advisor, your CPA, your attorney, you usually work in a, tr you know, a trio, a team, to make sure you're delivering a good product for your client. Um, but at the same time, if you have a third party involved and you're talking to your client, I mean, haven't you blown attorney-client privilege? I mean, there's a lot of litigation on that. So um, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I never do it, um, but I got to be cognizant of that, and, I, and the clients have to be cognizant of that. Um, and if they're okay with, um, and you think about that too, of course, in the context of a will contest. Um, is what we're talking about going to be, am I, got, am I have to testify? Is my, is my file wide open then for litigation because I had the um, financial advisor so well known? Oh, who didn't turn off your cell phone? What do you mean? <laughs> um, um, the engagement letter too. Um, your a malpractice carrier is going to want you to do an, an engagement letter on every single client that walks in your office. And I do that. Um, but I should. Um, and it's always a good thing to know, not only, and this goes into the scope of representation as well, for everybody just to be on the same page from day one. I mean, of course, ideally that's what we want. At the same time, um, a stale engagement letter is not the most friendly, warm, and fuzzy document to be sending out to your client after you just met them and they told you their life story. Um, but you got to figure out to find that happy medium um, between making sure they know what's going on and you've adequately disclosed the scope of your representation, what they can expect of you, um, especially in an estate planning context. Um, when a client comes in, they talk about an estate plan, you execute the documents, you send them on their way, they get a pretty little binder, and you know, and everything's hunky-dory. Um, what if tax laws change? What if there's a significant change in, um, I don't know, you know, guardianship law? Um, one you'll see time and time again, too, when you have a divorce situation, um, if you die and you have children with an ex-spouse, you can't prohibit your ex-spouse from getting custody of your children. I mean, unless they've terminated parental rights and, you know, that's a whole other thing. Um, and I don't know if there will be any huge changes on that front, but, you know, as laws change, as um, maybe they hit the lottery or they're just really good at their job and they accumulate wealth to the point where they now are subject to some estate taxes, Whose job is it to update the estate plan? Those are the things you want to address in your engagement letter. Is like, and again, that's kind of a cold, hard letter to send out to your client at the at the end of a representation, a termination of the relationship, or maybe something to slip into not slip, but put in with your final document, saying, "All right, we're done for now. But if you need anything else, I'm here to help you. Give me a call. But I'm not going to know if you know one of your kids gets." Um, who knows, in trouble and needs a special needs trust or whatever happens, happens. You've got to let me know what changes in your life to warrant some, you know, some change to your state plan. You know, and basically whose onus is it, the burden of proof or burden is on who to um, come in and alert um, you guys to changes. 
Um, we talked about joint representation, scope of the engagement. Um, was anybody at the symposium on Friday? It was about trust law. It was exciting stuff. Um, well, I find it exciting because I'm a nerd and probably don't have many friends. But at any rate, the trust, um, the trust, the trust situs um, industry in South Dakota is very, ex I mean, you wouldn't know it unless you practice in that area, but there's a lot going on. Um, and so there's a lot of times where our office will get calls from out-of-state counsel saying, I drafted this trust. It's going to be administered in South Dakota. Can you look at it and make sure it complies with South Dakota law? Sure, great, happy to help you. My engagement letter says, I'm looking for South Dakota law. I'm not looking at tax law. I'm not looking at the state where you guys are coming from for community property or anything like that. My scope of representation is South Dakota law um, only. And I, if you can get more particular, get more particular. Um, those letters, I don't mind being so cold and stuffy because I don't know these folks. And it's, I mean, it's just a different relationship. A lot of times you're either working for the firm, a drafted, um, drafted the initial document, or the clients, I mean, it's not usually a real close relationship, so it's, I don't feel so bad about being not as warm and fuzzy, but I've talked a long time, you guys. Yeah. Don't do them. Well, I shouldn't say that. Don't put your will in them, because that's the chicken and the egg. Um, thing because, and I've had it probably three times, where the original will we think is in the safety deposit box. Nobody's authorized to get in the safety deposit box because they want a personal representative appointed. You can't appoint a personal representative without the original will unless you do it the harder way, which is a formal probate and an affidavit and blah, blah, blah. So I don't like them, but not, I, I don't want the will to be in them. How about that? Otherwise, well, we have a nice litigation case about a joint or a safety deposit box and who got to take it out. And, um, so if you and I share a safe deposit box and I put a bunch of cash in there and you take it out, see, and, the, and a lot of times that's governed by what's on the flip side of that little agreement you sign with First Bank and something or other. So, yeah. So where do you suggest that clients keep their will? Do you... Um, I'm assuming you have a copy of the blog, yep. but I'm just wondering, we had a debate in our trust and wills class on like what right. the right answer to this question is. Well, I think we should compare notes because um, for practical matters, I prefer to keep it because my clients lose them. Um, and I always give them a copy. But then I know that can implicate some other issues. When I have custody of client information, and what happens in various scenarios. Um, it's always my client's choice, but more often than not, they'll want me to keep it, and I do want to keep it. But I, but you know, I probably minimize the liability exposure that I have by doing that. What did your class come up with? if you send the original and they're not very good at keeping records mm -hmm. or somebody else is going to potentially want yep. to destroy it. Right. Especially if they're the person to find it and yep. that also brings a different issue into play. Yep. So, so practically then, what do you do to be on notice that one of your clients has potentially received yep. it, especially if they move? Exactly. Um, that's always a constant struggle and a debate in our office as well because we've now we have two big, huge vaults that are not cheap to maintain or to buy in the first place and then maintain them. Because um, what if we have a fire? What if we have a flood? I mean, then I have liability there. We scan everything, so at least we have the electronic copy and can use that if we, something does happen to the original. Um, but we check the old bits in the Argus Leader every day. And, I, and that is only, you know, we can do online searches, I guess, now. And actually, last year, that was a project for one of our, um, a gal that we have just do some part-time stuff. She went and she made a, we have a list of what's in the vault. And she went online to see if she could Google, just by Google or whatever, find if folks had passed away. And then it's always, well, is this Joe Smith, the same Joe Smith that signed a will in 1925? 
you know. So we have a lot of old wills on that rice paper junk, you know, folded 20,000 ways like origami and, yeah. It's, yeah, it's not easy. I prefer to keep them. Maybe it's because I have control issues. But. Did your client ask when you reach out to them? I wait for them to reach out to me. I just think it's tacky if I reach out to them. You know, because it is their choice. They don't have to come back to our office to have it administered, have the estate administered. Um, I do always sign, uh, marketing tidbit, I do always sign, or I send a sympathy card, always, if I know of a client. And that is genuine. I'm kind of funny here, but I mean, I really love my clients. and I mean, that's a genuine thing, too. But I'd let them reach out to me. I am now almost, well, for estate planning, almost exclusively flat fee. Um, but what I always tell my clients, too, is I'm not going to really know. Everybody wants the simple will, you know, and I can't guarantee that you qualify for a simple will or the simple will is in your best interest. Um, so I, I'll meet with clients at no charge. Um, come in, tell me your deal. I'll tell you what I recommend, and I'll tell you what it costs. And then you can choose if you want to hire me and pay the fee. I think that's the only fair way to go about it. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, you, uh, you mentioned briefly on um, doing influence. Um, I do realize that in some of those other um, influences, influence cases, uh, it really hinges a lot on circumstantial evidence. Uh, are those pretty uh, rare causes of action to see? Is it pretty rare to see uh, a contested will on the basis of uh, new influence in South Dakota? Um, it's hard to say if it's the undue influence claim is harder to prove, of course, than the incapacity. Um, there, it's not hard to allege that. I mean, it's the, the old joke, it takes 50 bucks in the social security number to file an action. I mean, and it's true. Um, but at the same time, they are hard to win. Um, there was one in our jurisdiction that was lost a few years ago. Um, and it, it kind of shake, it kind of, I'm kind of shaking in my bones a little bit as an estate planner because the circumstances were this: that the decedent was wheelchair bound, didn't have a lot of control over his um, extremities, and so he relied on his second wife um, to write notes and present them to the attorney. Um, and because she had such a strong personality, ultimately that case was lost by the estate. Um, and they, there was a proof, there was a, a finding of an undue influence because, um, and again, I have to have the statute in front of me, but it has, um, there's a particular phrase in the statute that um, in order to have capacity to execute a will, you have to have, um, without prompting, do X, Y, and Z. Well, that trial court found that it was prompting to have the wife write down, you want Joe to get this, you want, you know, Billy to get that. That was prompting, you know. And if you would have asked me when that case first came in if there was undue influence, I said absolutely not, because the attorney who did the estate plan did everything right. I mean, he notified people, and you know, I would have done it, you know. And I and just so it's a, you can't predict what a jury can a jury will do. And if you're in trial techniques or whatever they call that nowadays, you'll know that. I mean, we understand the the tech the technicalities that go into statute, but. Um, a lot of times, a jury just kind of picks their favorite and goes with that one. Scary, but it's true. Yeah. So um, I do. Um, I make sure they're not whoever might be the undue influencer. I try because a lot of times, you know, you think about it. Especially, I'm in this situation where um, I have one sibling. He's in Germany. I live 20 miles from my mother, so I'm involved with her. Now, I have a confidential relationship with her, you know, so I meet the definition of potentially being an undue influencer, yet I'm the one, I took her to surgery this morning, you know, and so it's all those things where, you know, the person, the, the child or whoever it is that's potentially um, um, exerting the undue influence, um, it's often the person that's actually helping the decedent the most, but when I suspect it, I try to make sure they have an independent ride to my office, or I'll go see them, 
so that because that's the always the thing on the way to my office is you know their son trying to say oh you should do X Y and Z I want to avoid all those conversations so my conference my communication needs to be directly with the client not through other channels they need to have an independent ride to my office much less they cannot be in the in the room when I'm talking to the decedent because I want them to tell me in their own words again without prompting what do you want um, and so I try to basically isolate them from the person that is perhaps allegedly and even if they're not even if I don't suspect it I don't I want I want the estate to be administered free of those allegations so you want to make sure again you're building your case for litigation later so that you can defend your actions and your decedent's wishes um, as best you can. So is yeah. it then your policy to always tell third party who may have brought their mother to think that you could wait here out to her yep. privately? Yep. And I always tell them, if you're in there, um, it's going to look bad in hindsight. You know, just tell them that. It's, if you want the estate plan to hold up, you better not be in here. And so if the client is that CYA, CYA letter. Nope. Yeah, because you'll have those stubborn clients too that absolutely know and you know have these strong beliefs. Um, again, you know, we get paid to give advice. We can't guarantee our clients are going to take it. And we get paid the same whether they take it or not. You know, um, and it's, I always tell my husband, I'm not offended when you don't take my advice. It happens to me all the time. So. I, but that's true. I mean, you get paid. I get paid to tell you my opinion, and I'm not offended if you don't take it. Do you ever come across estates that you recommend not to distribute or just to let them probate? No. The I, I realize the statute says it's supposed to be done efficiently. Well, yeah, efficiently is in the eye of the beholder. What I have turned down actually doing an estate plan at all. Um, there was one where um, it was just obvious from the get-go that um, a child was taking mom around to different law firms trying to get an estate plan changed. Um, and after the fact, found out that he was at two offices before mine. I just declined the representation. I mean, because I didn't have the long-standing relationship to know where she was at, and you know, I just there was it was just rely on your instincts. I'll say that with legal, as a lawyer, rely on your instincts. Same thing with being a parent, rely on your instincts because um, you'll. I mean, some folks just don't pass the smell test when they come into your office. Yeah. But I'd love to share war stories or anything else if you have any more questions. If you want to get out of here, it's nice out. Have you been asked to do a Sharia-based state plan? A what? A Sharia law-based state plan? No. No. That sounds fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny, but even the trending, you know, we are a little bit isolated here in South Dakota um, from different issues. Taxes, you know, and I saw a poster up for LGBT, or, you know, and so there's a lot. And I'm glad I, I've gone to those. Um, for Minnesota, I have to keep up my CLE credits, and but there's a lot of good issues that you got to be aware of. I didn't address that here, but you know, if you're if you're in South Dakota, we don't recognize that as a legal marriage um, between same-sex folks. So, um, but I've done estate plans, you know, but you got to work around that because they don't have automatic rights that a spouse would and should and could and um, that kind of thing. So that's something I never touched on here, but I can see even in South Dakota that we would have laws probably amended in the next 10 years, I would guess. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.